Okay, good morning, everyone. We're going to make a start. So, uh, welcome. Today is the first day of Dreamforce, which is really cool. And we're all here. And we're here for a breakout session. Um, maybe your first one. If it is, welcome. Um, this might also be your first forward-looking statement, but it certainly won't be the last that you'll be seeing over the next four days. Uh, we're going to be talking about the future of the Metadata API. So we're not going to do too much forward-looking statements, but please don't make any purchasing decisions based on anything we say, just on what's available right now. So uh, this is a session uh, for people who are uh, working with managed packages. The Metadata API is a way of modifying your metadata, which is basically what a managed package is, just a, a set of metadata. And if you are working with unmanaged code, then why would you bother using the Metadata API? Just use the right tool for the job. Go in and use the visual, uh, visual stuff. And so if you are wanting to create a self-configuring app, um, then now you have the Metadata API at your disposal. So perhaps you're a developer who is building these managed packages. Uh, perhaps you're an admin who is working with managed packages or installing them in your org. And you've heard that the Metadata API is now native to uh, Apex, and you're worried, perhaps, that these apps have now got all of this extra power and can change things in your org. Um, but that's, there's nothing to worry about there, and we'll cover that in more detail as we go through this session. But enough about you. Let's talk about me and my colleague, Dan. Uh, so I'm David Frud, and this is Daniel Butler-Tavener. And we are both senior software engineers at Financial Force. Uh, Financial Force is an ISV. We build solutions on the Salesforce platform. Uh, we have a range of different solutions um, targeting back office. So our flagship product is accounting, but we also have stuff in uh, product uh, in PSA, human resources, um, revenue recognition, all of these different solutions which integrate together and also with Salesforce CRM to give you a complete back office solution. And come and visit us at booth 324. So today we're going to be talking about the Metadata API. We're going to be talking about the classic version of it, the thing that's been around for years, what you already know and love. And then we're going to talk about the Apex Metadata API, new as of summer 17. We're going to describe our sample app that we've built, which allows you to play with this stuff, uh, both old and new way. We're going to talk about the use case for it within Financial Force to sort of set it into context, see how you might want to use this yourself. We're going to be talking about trust, which is obviously a key value on the Salesforce platform, and then the roadmap, and then we'll have time at the end for Q&A. But if you don't get around to speaking to us, uh, we'll be hanging around at the end of this session, so come and find us. So I'm going to hand over to Dan, who's going to tell you about the Metadata API. Thank you, David. So. Firstly, just to make sure everyone understands exactly what we mean by metadata. So in your Salesforce org, you have data, which is made up of uh, records of accounts, contacts, custom objects. And completely separately to that, you have all the customizations, all the entities that you'd find in setup, and everything is stored as metadata. Even though what metadata is is quite wide ranging, it covers things like Apex classes, it covers workflows, page layouts, permission sets, but they still all count as metadata. So <clears throat> just as with your data, you can access it off platform, Salesforce provides lots of different APIs. Uh, for example, the REST API, SOAP API, allowing you to access your data off platform. Now, the same is true for metadata. Salesforce gives us an API called the Metadata API. And this allows us to do deploys and retrieves, which are asynchronous file-based operations. It also allows us to do CRUD operations to work with, read, and update metadata in our org. Now, the reason behind why Salesforce gives us this is because they expect us to create some um, custom um, development tools. To illustrate this, the Metadata API is the tool that's used behind the scenes for things like Maven's Mate, 
Workbench and uh, AMP migration tool. To show you what that looks like, uh, we can take a look at this diagram. You've got an external user. They connect to an external web application. They have to authenticate to connect to Salesforce, and then they're able to update custom metadata. Now, the metadata API was intended to be used off-platform, but it's possible to use it within Apex. And the reason that's possible is because Apex, by sort of standard functionality, allows you to do callouts. And if you do a callout and you set the endpoint to the endpoint of the metadata API, you then can do anything that the metadata API can do, but from within Apex. Now, you can do that yourself. The principle is quite, um, quite simple. You can generate your own Apex class, and you can use the WSDL for uh, the metadata API in Salesforce to do that. However, there's no need to do that whatsoever. At Financial Force, we have a few open source projects. One of them is this one here called Apex-MD API. And anyone can use that. It's completely open source. It includes uh, the, all the different metadata types, the operations uh, that you can call on the callout, and uh, cov test coverage, as well as, um, as well as some utility components. Uh, we found that out of all our open source projects, this is by far the most popular. It's got over 300 stars and uh, over 360 forks. And um, this really shows that trying to make these changes to metadata is something that a lot of developers out there are trying to do. This is what that um, implementation looks like. We are always in Salesforce, but because we're doing a call out, we go outside of where we're authenticated and we have to come back in. Now, doing stuff in this way isn't always going to work perfectly. There are a few drawbacks. So the whole thing is quite fragile because you're doing this call out. You need to set up a remote site setting. Um, you're subject to all the usual governance limits around doing call outs. Uh, you need to re-authenticate re yourself to come back in, which we saw from the diagram. And you can do that in one of two ways. You can either use OAuth, which is complex to do a new login, or you can re reuse the session ID of the, uh, the Salesforce uh, user who's already authenticated, but that comes with it some drawbacks as well. So for example, a user must always remain logged in during the time uh, if you're doing any asynchronous processing. And there are some Salesforce features uh, which get in the way. So for example, one of them enforces that a session ID can only be used from the IP address that did the login. As we're running all of this from Apex, which runs on the server, it's going to be a different IP address, and therefore um, it's not going to work unless you disable those features. Users must um, be API enabled. That comes with it some, um, some side effects. For example, you need to give them modify all permissions. And if a new Salesforce major release comes along, you can continue using the Metadata API version that you're currently running. But if you want to use new features, the code doesn't update automatically. You've just got an Apex class which is built off a particular version, and therefore you have to upgrade it or, um, manually. With all these drawbacks in mind, some three years ago, Andy, who is our CTO, he raised an idea on Idea Exchange to basically say, it's great that we can do all these changes in Apex, but wouldn't it be great if Salesforce provided us with this is a native feature, and then we wouldn't have all the drawbacks that we're encountering. That got a lot of support from the developer community, especially from ISVs. And as a result, Salesforce took notice. And in summer 17, we got a brand new feature called the Apex Metadata API. So in this, we don't have to do callouts anymore, which is great. Salesforce just provide us with native functionality. 
and all we need to do simply is use two different methods. The first one is retrieve, which is going to query our metadata records in the first place. That runs synchronously. And then if we want to update them again, we can modify those records in memory. We can add new ones. And when we want to make saves, we can call NQ deployment. Now this runs asynchronously. When we call NQ deployment, it's going to set up a deployment in the background. But we can hook into um, when that deployment has been completed by simply implementing the deploy callback implementation um, interface, which is new. Uh, and then we can handle whether the deployment was successful or whether it failed. Before anyone gets too far ahead of themselves, this is a brand new feature, so it's quite young, it's not very feature rich, and so there are limitations. So it only works for retrieve and deploy at the moment, and you can only use it for two different types of custom, uh, of metadata. And those two types are page layouts and custom metadata. So if you're only retrieving and modifying those two types of metadata, this is the feature for you. It has everything that you need. However, if you want to do anything else, then you need to know about the metadata API callout uh, method, as that's going to be your backup. Now I'm going to pass back over to David, who's going to show us a sample app uh, where we illustrate how to use both of those um, features, uh, and it's something that you can all download yourself and try out. Thank you. Okay, hi again, everyone. So yeah, we've built a sample app concentrating on one of those two supported types, page layouts, just because it's easy to understand and conceptualize. Um, but similar things can be done with custom metadata types. So how do you define a page layout? Let me count the ways. Page layouts are complicated. They are um, the buttons that are available and their ordering. They are all of the fields and where they appear within the layout. They're all the related lists and the actions against them and the fields that are visible. And all manner of things that you can see up in the palette in the top there in the standard page layout editor. So let's focus on just fields. A field is a layout item. We could equally add a blank space into this. An item lives within a column. Uh, a section can have one or two columns, and columns are defined as part of a section. So if you have a look at the account layout file, hopefully this XML format looks familiar to you, and you can see a mirror of that. You have sections, and nested underneath the sections are columns. Nested underneath the columns are the items. But if we wanted to describe that using Apex, you'll have something that looks a bit like this. You have a layout section, which has primitive properties defining um, all of the interesting bits about a section, and also nested within that, all of the layout columns. And all of these DTOs are defined as part of a massive class. You can see the line numbers there, over 10,000 lines long, just listing all of the different um, types that the metadata API supports. So there's your sections and there's your columns. If we wanted to do an operation, we might want to just take a canned layout and save it. Um, but more interesting than that is modifying a layout that we've read in from somewhere else. So if we want to remove a field from a layout, all we need to do is iterate through the sections, iterate through the columns, iterate through the items. And if we find a matching field, just remove it and perform our save. And we've already just removed the field. So it's as simple as that. In order to read the metadata, we have to say the type we're interested in and the name of the um, metadata we're trying to retrieve. And once we've retrieved it, we can uh, synchronously save that and take a look at the results, the save results, to see whether it was successful or failed. And if it failed, why did it fail? In order to switch over to the Apex metadata API, thankfully, is fairly trivial. Instead of using our metadata service generated class for all of our DTOs, we're just going to go over to the metadata namespace where there's counterparts for all of the same DTOs, uh, which you'd expect because it's the same API under the scenes. The difference comes when we try to perform the save. So now we're always forced to do asynchronous. 
which is a good thing because page uh, layout and other metadata operations can be long running. So we can um, define our deploy callback. And just like a JavaScript callback, it's something that's going to get executed. Um, you're going to call the handle result method on your interface, which allows you to have context and um, whether or not your deployment succeeded. So you can react accordingly and tell the user if there was a problem along the way. So with that, we're going to switch over to the sample app. Um, but first, we'll tell you how to find it. This is an open source project. If you go to GitHub and search for DF17MD API, it's only one result, and that's the sample app that we've built. This is a sample app built using uh, SFDX. There's a one-click deploy button, so you don't need to get everything set up locally. You can just deploy to a fresh scratch org and have a play with this. And if you haven't used SFDX before, then um, this might be a good way to dip your toe in. It's also um, a GIF there showing you roughly what we're going to be seeing um, now. So if you can switch over to the sample app, please. So this is the sample app. It's all built in Lightning. Uh, down at the bottom there, we have the utility bar. In the utility bar, we have a Lightning component. And if you expand the Lightning component, um, this is discovering the currently selected S object type. And from that, uh, working out all of the available fields on that S object type. And then it's going to allow you to add or remove fields. And when you're adding fields, it can describe the behavior, which is, is it editable or is it read only? Or is it required? And finally, it allows you to define whereabouts you're going to inject fields into the layout. So if you scroll down a bit, please. Um, we've defined different anchor types. You can put it at the start or at the end of the layout, or you can put it before or after another field. And if you say before or after another field, the last field there just lets you define which one of you, you want. So um, we're going to make a change to the current layout. So nice and simple, we're going to add a field at the start, and the field is going to be account rating. And we're going to use the classic metadata API to do that. So if we hit update, this is using platform events. So we see that the page layout uh, updated successfully. And if we reload the page, we'll see the account rating field is now part of the layout. Great. OK, now we're going to switch over to using the native Apex Metadata API. Um, but everything else looks pretty much the same to the end user. We're going to go to native mode. And this time, we're going to add the account number. And again, just anchor it to the start for simplicity. And this time, when we hit update, it now happens in two phases. One is that we're going to enqueue a deployment. And then on completion of that, we're calling the deploy callback, which is going to raise another platform event that tells us whether or not the operation succeeded. Did it succeed? I didn't see that. Yeah. Not sure what happened to the platform event, but the, um, the layout has been updated successfully. So that's good. Um, but bear in mind that you're subject to all of the normal um, constraints of using the metadata API. So you can't do things that you wouldn't normally be able to do through the front end. If I try to remove a required field, like account name, then I'm going to get an error. So again, we're going to enqueue the deployment. And we'll get the platform event saying, you can't do that. That doesn't make sense. No one would ever be able to save any accounts. So that's good, that protects us, but it's worth bearing in mind. OK, and with that, we're going to talk about the financial force use case for the Metadata API. So I'm going to hand over to Dan for that. Thank you, David. <clears throat> OK, so the great thing about that sample app is it shows you um, in a very easy to understand way how to use this code. And it's something you can play around with. But once you got used to it, you might be thinking, can I add this to a enterprise application? And the answer is yes, because that's exactly what we've done here at Financial Force. So our use case is called the Feature Console. The um, reason behind creating the Feature Console is that when we create a new package of um, a new version of our packages, we ship it out to our customers, and we're expecting them to upgrade straight away, start using our new features. However, 
this isn't always uh, the case. It's not always as simple as that. From a customer's point of view, new features mean that employees need to have training to know how to use the system. That needs to be provisioned sometimes. It needs to be fitted in. Also, new processes might require testing in a sandbox. Again, something that takes time. And to avoid disruption, you might defer your upgrades to a period of time where the business is a bit quieter. And all of these things mean that upgrades don't happen straight away, which is a problem for us because we want to do uh, push upgrades and we can't do them without upsetting our customers because of all these issues. So our solution to that is um, something that takes inspiration from the critical update screen in Salesforce. So if anyone knows about the critical update screen, they'll hopefully understand the concept behind the feature console. The uh, concept is that all new features go in turned off, and this means that between one version to the next, there should be as little visible changes to the user as possible, and therefore they can just simply upgrade and continue working as they would normally. However, when comes a time where the admin is happy, all the uh, users have been trained and it's ready to, um, to enable that feature and start using it, they can go to the Feature Console screen. That will give them a list of all features uh, that are able to be enabled. And when they um, click a toggle switch on there, the feature is enabled, and that's the point where the system changes in a visible way. Now, enabling a feature can be as simple as setting a flag in our system, which changes the way our code behaves. But most features aren't just code changes. They involve changes to metadata. So, we also have changes to layouts, permissions, pick list values, and applications. And those changes, so that they're not visible straight away, shouldn't happen until our feature enables them. And therefore, we have to run some code in Apex that uses um, one of the two versions of the metadata API. So just to illustrate that, we are going to have a demo. But it's going to be very quick. Um, and this is our Feature Console screen. So if we start with scrolling down, we can see the list of all features that can be enabled by a customer. Some of these are real ones that actually come from our product. Some are just examples that we use for testing. Before we go into one, it's worth pointing out this information box at the top. And this is basically telling us that the remote site setting hasn't been uh, set yet, so therefore any any steps that require a call out to the metadata API are going to fail. If we look at exactly what the endpoint for that remote site setting is, we can see that it includes the subdomain and the instance of Salesforce for um, our current org. So therefore, it's not something that we can easily ship um, and package with our product. Instead, it has to be created at runtime. And the two ways that that can be achieved are by us um, getting the admin to uh, manually add the remote site setting through uh, setup, which we've given them enough information to do. Uh, and that's important because it means the admin has complete control over their own metadata if they so wish. However, if they trust what we're doing, they can do all of that automatically by simply pressing this create remote site setting. And that will run in the background and add it. Now, it looks different uh, to our version, but in the open source repo, there is, in fact, a component which uh, does a very similar uh, functionality, and that's something that anyone can use if they so wish. Now, if we go into example feature, see what it looks like. Uh, firstly, there's this toggle button at the top. That's what we are going to uh, switch to enable a feature. But before that, we might want to make metadata changes. So, Below is a list of all the changes. These are our feature steps. And firstly, to point out, in the step description, we're telling the user exactly what's going to happen when the perform button is pressed. In this case, we're going to update some pick list values. And as pick list values aren't one of the two uh, metadata types that are supported by the Summer 17 feature, it means we're going to have to use the call out. And that's what's going to happen when we press perform. We're running a synchronous um, operation, and when that's done, we inform the user. 
Now, if we scroll down to step four, this is uh, updating a page layout. Now, page layouts are one of the features that we were able to do with Summer 17 changes, and therefore, when we press reform here, it's gonna do exactly the same thing in terms of changing metadata, but this time we're in queuing a deployment, therefore we get in progress because this is asynchronous. However, when it's done, we mark it as done and it appears exactly the same as, um, as any of our other features that do use the call out. So if we move on, the next section is about trust. So the Metadata API gives you a lot of power to modify any metadata that you want. However, with great power comes great responsibility, and we know that trust is a very important principle to Salesforce. Therefore, how do we main trust when we're doing this? For the Summer 17 feature, this is very easy, because Salesforce know exactly how we're gonna use it, they thought hard about it, and they've created a set of rules for us to follow. Now, um, those rules are summarized in this table, and the table is taken straight out of the development uh, documentation from Salesforce. There's a distinction between public metadata and protected metadata here, and what the difference between those two things is, is that for a few different metadata types, such as custom metadata and custom settings, a developer can mark them as protected and as a result, it stops anyone else apart from the code within the same managed package from accessing that metadata. And if we look at that column, that's very easy. We always have access to our own protected metadata if we're in a managed package uh, because it's our metadata. We're the only ones that can access it, so uh, we can do what we like with it. For public metadata, things are different. So, the first row says that unmanaged code can always access public metadata. That's because um, the unmanaged code belongs to the org and the org is the one that uh, owns the metadata. When you've got managed code, um, you have to show that you're trustworthy enough to, uh, to access this uh, public metadata. And to do that, you need to pass security review. And if you do that, then everything's absolutely fine. You can access the public metadata. Now, you shouldn't just go ahead and um, change metadata under the nose of the admin without them knowing. You need to make sure that you've told them exactly what you're gonna do and make sure you've got consent to do that. And the way you do that is by adding this description at the bottom. This package can access and change metadata outside its namespace in the Salesforce org where it's installed. If you add that to the package description, uh, then you've done that. And that's actually a requirement because if you're gonna pass security view, Salesforce are gonna check that you've put that message in your package description, and if you haven't, then you're gonna come into the bottom row where you've got managed code, but you've not got a security review. In that um, scenario, you don't have access by default to public metadata, but it can still be enabled by um, setting an org preference that says deploy metadata from non-certified package versions via Apex. And it's worth noting that that row is particularly useful if you're trying to test out a beta package that hasn't gone through security review yet. Now trust is um, not just important for the new Summer uh, 17 features, it's also important uh, in general and it's important for the callout version of the Metadata API. So to maintain trust, some principles you should follow, and that's what we've done with Feature Console. Always keep the user informed, tell them what changes you're gonna make, uh, why you're gonna make those changes, and give them enough information so that if they uh, wanna keep complete control of all their metadata, they can make all these changes manually themselves through setup. We need to um, set up a remote site setting. We can't just connect to any old endpoint, uh, so that's a requirement. And if we think about the metadata we're changing, if it's public metadata, it's um, also accessible by the admin through the setup menu. And they might have spent many long hours trying to get their customizations just right. It's important that we don't go in and then undo all their work. So we need to avoid destructive changes. So for example, the Apex Metadata API doesn't support delete. 
Um, that's because it's a very destructive change. You can still do it through the um, metadata API callout, but if you do, you should think very carefully about uh, what you're doing. And it's important to always uh, respect um, what customizations uh, admins have done declaratively. You should always read what's already there um, and try and um, put yourself in the shoes of the admin that spent all that time working on customizations and don't undo them all. Now, the Apex Metadata API is a brand new feature that came in summer 17, so where's it gonna go? And this uh, roadmap um, takes into account all the forward-looking statement that we mentioned at the beginning. So winter 18, that's come, and we know that we've not added any new features um, for the Apex Metadata API. However, from some conversations we've had with Salesforce, uh, we're expecting in spring 18 to get a lot more. We're hoping to get lots more metadata types that are supported, uh, including custom fields and pick list values. Um, however, it's worth mentioning that uh, deleting metadata isn't something that there's plans to um, implement. That's because there's no um, use case that Salesforce currently have, and we've not been able to provide them with one. But if you do have a good use case, feel free to contact Salesforce and um, you might change the priority on uh, that feature. So that comes to the end of the presentation. So thank you for everyone who uh, attended. Uh, we're gonna move on to some Q&A, uh, but before we do that, it's just worth pointing out some links that we've included at the end of the slide deck. Um, so the first two here are some blogs which explain some of these features. So uh, firstly, we have one from Salesforce which explains the Apex Metadata API. And then equivalently for the uh, callout version of the Metadata API, we have a blog from Andy, our CTO. The next two links are from GitHub. So the first one is where you can find the open source repo uh, that you can use for doing the callout. And the second one is where you can find the uh, the sample app that we've shown you if you want to just play around with these features and get to know them and understand them. Then for Apex Metadata API, we've included the release notes from Summer 17 and also a link to the developer docs. And if anyone wants uh, any more information, uh, there's a, uh, another session that's going to be given by Salesforce. Uh, and uh, there's a link to that session, and it's on Wednesday at 11 a.m. And finally, if you like what uh, we as Financial Force uh, have um, presented, uh, there's also a link to all the other sessions that our company is giving uh, throughout Dreamforce. So if you take a look at that, you can see if there's anything else you want to attend. We'll switch back to questions and answers. Um, anyone who wants to ask a question, uh, can we ask that you come to the, uh, um, to the microphone so that everyone can hear you? What are the advantages of using the uh, metadata.retrieve syntax versus querying it like an S object? Um, so it depends what you're using. Some metadata you can retrieve using um, Sockle, uh, such as custom metadata types, but you can't do that for everything. So um, for something like uh, like the uh, pick list values you can do through, through describe, can't you? Yeah. But, um, I think there are some examples of things that you would only be able to do. So page layouts before we were able to do uh, it natively, they were um, required. The, the only way you could get them was through using the API. Anyone else? Does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious about that future enablement console you guys made, um, specifically like how Obviously, you have metadata that's included or created on package install, and then you have people opting out and pausing that and then opting into it. So do you have post-install scripts or something for people after a specific version to automatically opt them into that metadata creation? I can feel that. So we tried to use post-install scripts, and they conflicted with our patterns. There were some uh, namespace collisions with the class that we use for a dependency injection. So. We don't use post-install scripts at all. When we ship a package, it is everything. All of the new features are there in a dormant state, ready to be enabled. 
So we will include new pages, new layouts, and permissions, but the permissions won't be assigned. And if we need to run any sort of Apex script, we have a step type which will invoke any custom Apex defined within any of our managed packages. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you very much. We'll be around.